Hey, hi everybody. It's Christina Merkley, the Shifted Coach. Really pleased to have a special guest. I have Vladimir Stoyakovich with me. So, welcome, Vlad. Thank you. How would you go about describing uh, who you are and what your specialty is? I could try to do it, but you'd probably do a better job. <laughs> okay. So, what I do is uh, something that we call spiritual technology. Simply speaking, uh, spiritual technology has two purposes. Uh, one purpose is something like a therapy. Okay, you can think about it as a form of therapy for mentally healthy people. Uh, with it, you can remove negative states, uh, mainly negative thoughts and negative emotions. And by removing those from your, uh, from your life, uh, you increase the quality of your life. That's one purpose. Uh, the other purpose would be spiritual development. Mm. What happens when you use uh, a spiritual technology, it happens at the same time. Uh, you remove negative reactions, you remove barriers to your goals, you also remove uh, traumatic experiences. And all that will definitely increase the quality of one's life. It will increase, uh, uh, it will change how you perceive yourself, it will change how you perceive world. You will be uh, less uh, reactive and you will be more functional. And at the same time, what happens is, is spiritual development. S simply speaking, uh, what is spiritual development? It's uh, removing uh, suppressed thoughts and emotions. Uh, thoughts and emotions we identified with. And as we remove uh, suppressed thoughts and emotions, uh, our consciousness becomes uh, clearer and clearer. And our per perception of ourselves and of the life changes. It, are, they, are those always unconscious or you can be conscious of them as well? Well, what is bothering us is not uh, our conscious thoughts and emotions, okay? What is bothering us is what is unconscious. If I say, for example, many people, many clients say, my problem is I feel I'm not good enough or I think I'm not good enough. So that's, that, that's what is on the surface. However, every problem that we state, uh, uh, every problem that we state is just the surface layer of a much bigger structure. You can think about the problem like an onion. Okay, people like using that metaphor, like an onion. And what do you see? You see the surface layer. However, there is a structure of unconscious thoughts and emotions which is beneath, and we are not aware of those. And when we use these methods, they are made to make all these suppressed thoughts and emotions conscious. Hmm. And that's how we basically disassemble this problem. After doing a successful session on, a, for example, problem, I feel I'm not good enough, we can still have this thought, but because there is no charge, there is no uh, structure beneath, it doesn't bother us anymore. It doesn't feel like truth anymore. So yes, uh, basically in order to start uh, working on a problem, maybe a fear of public speaking, we are aware of the problem, but it's only the surface layer. Mm -hmm. okay? What we are not aware of are many thoughts and emotions created in uh, various experiences of our life. Okay, mm -hmm. it's like we go through our lives, uh, different things happen, uh, we have unpleasant experiences, we make certain decisions, we suppress, uh, suppress thoughts and emotions, and it accumulates. Okay, and in one point, uh, a number of those thoughts and emotions, they, they form a problem. Okay, so what we want to do, we want to start from a problem, we want to disassemble it, literally, mm -hmm. okay, so mm -hmm. the problem doesn't exist anymore. Mm take it all apart, how it's been built within that person. That's exactly, that's exactly what we do. So in spiritual technology, we do not analyze, we do not talk for a long time. Mm -hmm. We have a procedure. We follow the procedure. The yeah, procedure is simply made to make, uh, to, uh, make all those thoughts and emotions uh, conscious. Mm -hmm. okay, once you make all building blocks of one problem conscious, they are not compulsive anymore. Interesting. Yeah. And yes. this charge, I want to come back and ask you more about that charge and also about where that charge, because it's somatic, isn't it? It's lodged it in different through. places in the body. Before we get yeah. there, let me just ask, um, how did you get into this? What's your path? Okay, well, uh, you know, uh, one spiritual teacher said uh, that one uh, uh, gets interested, he steps on a spiritual path when the terror of the mind becomes unbearable. <laughs> yes. Prob that's probably, the, that's probably <laughs> the, the best Pain definition. Pain motivates all of us. <laughs> well, yeah. yes. 
So what happened to me, I, since I was like 12, uh, 13 years old, I was looking for something. Only at that time I didn't know what I was looking for. Mm. When I was 18, 19, I was already in a relatively bad uh, uh, psychological state. Mm. Okay? And I was looking for some uh, way out of it. Uh, and then I found the books of Zivorat Slavinsky. Mm -hmm. He is the founder of uh, spiritual technology. I was lucky to live in the same city and in the same country. Uh, and as I found those books, uh, I, was, I realized that I found what I was looking for. Okay, basically, I was looking for spiritual development. Before, I thought I was looking for myself somehow, as if there are two of me, me and myself. And I was thinking that I'm looking for some kind of profession, to find some kind of profession which will fulfill me. But no, I wasn't actually looking for that. I was looking for spiritual development. Mm -hmm. And when I was, when I was 19... Uh, I started uh, doing this, so uh, what we call spiritual technology, and then in the beginning I was only doing it on myself. Then I was doing it on other people in one-to-one -one sessions, and then I started running seminars. I was like, I think it was 1998, 26, 27, and uh, I was doing uh, uh, spiritual technology as my second job, and then seven, eight years ago I only uh, switched to doing uh, spiritual mm -hmm. technology as my f full-time profession. Yeah. It seems to, because um, I've been around the block studying a lot of different things, and it's taken me a while to find this, it seems to be a little hidden gem in some ways. Has it, has it grown over that time? And you, you mentioned Ziggurat and being in the same geography, lucky you, so okay. and especially to get that at that, the age that you did, so young. Yeah. Is it it's known true. more in that area, and it's starting to trickle out more worldwide? or? It's actually very known in this area, more yeah. than in other countries. Yeah. Uh, Zivorat's first books appeared in 19, I think in 1973, okay? And you, ha you, you have to consider uh, this country at that time. It was a communist country, mm -hmm. okay? And basically, spiritual things were not encouraged. Mm -hmm. In a way, wow. they were discouraged. Even more okay? amazing yeah. that it came from those roots, yeah. Yes, and he is a clinical psychologist as well, so he has this... Formal, uh, formal ed education as well. So when his books appeared, it, they were basically the only books you were able to find in bookstores, in public. So, and over time, over time, uh, he beca he became uh, our biggest authority on spiritual methods. Okay, and then uh, when uh, the technique, uh, when he created the technique called Deep, Deep it was 1999. Uh, the technique was very powerful and then it became known outside of the former Yugoslavia. And that's how he became known outside of uh, this country. So yes, it's pretty big here, but it's becoming quite known in other countries as well. Yeah. Well, and you're being invited by the likes of Tony Robbins to come on stage and, and work with his yes. audiences as well, aren't you? Yes, what happened, uh, Tony found out about this and uh, uh, he invited me to demonstrate this technique to him. It's what I did. He liked it. <laughs> and then from time to time, he calls me to do uh, 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 deep beat uh, spiritual technology sessions with his clients. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So thank you. That kind of helps uh, the people in my audience. They're often process professionals. So they're very mm -hmm. curious about mm -hmm. how people come to be doing what they're doing. So it's great to hear a little bit about your path and that. Um, also that spiritual quest, right? We're, we're often looking for methods that will, in essence, help us feel better, <laughs> right? Yes. So, so and it's, int it's interesting, some people too are, are not just on that track, but also on the spiritual development track, which uh, I am and often people associated with me are. So it's nice to have that layer associated as well. Um, Part, we're going to accompany this. My students will be able to see a session that you did recently with me, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it definitely led to that Unity One place, which is just f beautiful to, to connect with. And we were speaking earlier about uh, how grateful, appreciative I am of that and how it's creating a ripple effect. It's very interesting, the, this non-charge feel. So, hey, yes, yeah. yes. So can we, let's talk a little bit about what charge means and yep. get it a little bit into the polarity side of things okay. and the body. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I understand. So what is charge? Uh, simply speaking, charge, that's just suppressed 
thoughts and emotions. We say there are four uh, elements of charge, and they are mental images, uh, thoughts, emotions, and body sensations. And when you think about it, it's only two categories, mental and emotional category. Uh, mental category is uh, images and thoughts. Emotional category is emotions and body sensations. So we have uh, unconscious, and it is full of these uh, suppressed thoughts and emotions. Uh, and to make things worse, the nature of unconscious is very, uh, it's, it's conflicting, okay? We have many thoughts and emotions which are opposite to one another, okay? You know how people say that we live in a, in a bipolar universe? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, scientists uh, say that everything that exists in this universe must have two poles, like a battery, pl plus and minus. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl Gustav Jung noticed the same thing, pointed out the same thing in the human being. Okay, he says that in the human being, it's pretty much the same as in nature. Our thoughts and emotions exist in these bipolar structures. And when you think about, for example, uh, freedom and bondage, if you somehow erase the idea of bondage, the idea, the idea of freedom becomes completely mm. irrelevant. Okay, it's only there in relation to bondage. So we have this, uh, we have unconscious, and it is full of suppressed thoughts and emotions, full of conflict, conflicting thoughts and emotions. And we have so many of those suppressed thoughts and emotions that uh, when they accumulate, they become so dense and they create an illusion of a unit, a duality, me as a separate unit not connected to the outside world, like separation as opposed to oneness. Right. Okay? That's what we call the ego. Simply we accumulate thoughts and emotions, we accumulate, we suppress, we suppress, and in one moment we have, we have so many of those that they become not penetrable for our perception and we perceive that we are this uh, unit and that we are going to die when our body dies okay we don't perceive oneness we perceive uh, this separation okay that's where all the problems come from mm. the question is why do we have the ego why do we have these all suppressed thoughts and emotions well it's not like that we are punished okay from some evil god uh, the <laughs> reason good to know. <laughs> yeah that is, but there, is a, there is a specific reason why, why we have uh, uh, the ego. Uh, think about this. Uh, when a baby is born, that baby uh, doesn't have awareness. The baby is, uh, the nature of the baby is consciousness. It's the same as you and me. It doesn't change, okay? But the baby doesn't have awareness. And uh, in order to become aware, it has to create identities. It has to identify with the body, with the space, with energy, as opposed, so this is me, as opposed to non-me. And by feeling these identities, awareness is developed. Then we create uh, many impressions about ourselves, impressions about the rest of the world, and there is interaction between the self and the rest of the world. It all happens within us, okay? Yeah. But, and then we have, we create all these uh, suppressed thoughts and emotions, and we identify with some of those thoughts and emotions, uh, creating identities. And the more we have, uh, the, the, the mm -hmm. bigger the ego is, so to speak. And then it creates this illusion of uh, uh, separation. However, the ego has a purpose. The purpose of the ego is to, for us to develop awareness. Okay, now we are aware. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it happens that the ego doesn't develop properly. Uh, when it happens, the, uh, these people are mentally ill. Okay, so you cannot be, become a healthy adult without having, uh, without developing uh, an ego. Okay, it will create your awareness. We need it. Yep. Yep. Yes. Uh, it basically, it's an evolutionary device. Hmm. However, what happens uh, when we gain our awareness? We don't need the ego anymore. But we cannot get rid of it because we are identified with it. We think we are it. Okay? And that's why spiritual development was created. That's how, I don't know, 8,000 years ago it started. Okay? The only purpose of spiritual development now is to remove the ego, to remove what we identified with, so at the end we have both. We have awareness and we are also aware of oneness. Hmm. Before we remove the ego, we are aware of the ego. When I close my eyes and I ask myself who I am, some identity pops up, okay? I feel this happy person or unhappy person, a brave person or a coward, a body or I don't know, whatever identity may come up, okay? So we feel the identity, we don't feel our true nature. 
and the purpose of uh, spiritual development is to remove all that so we again can perceive uh, who and what we really are, which is oneness, which is uh, a being, non-material being, presence, which is not separated from the rest of the world. So that's why we have this uh, charge. So it's not, so, it's not like a, as I said, it's not like a punishment. Uh, it's basically a device. However, once uh, its purpose is fulfilled, we need somehow to get rid of it. That's the second part of the evolution. And that's why spiritual development is there, and that's why these methods of spiritual technology are there. There is a perception, there is a perception which is common, that spiritual development techniques and the spiritual development in itself is some, somehow separated from practical life. But it's not, okay? You can think about three things. You can think about uh, problems, you can think about goals, and you can think about spiritual development. Mm. Uh, when we have problems, for example, when I have fear of public speaking, it's because I have charge. And if I have a goal, for example, my goal could be to start my own business. Mm -hmm. And if I feel doubt, insecurity about it, again, it's charge. Mm -hmm. Again, it's charge. When we have goals, we have to take action if we want to achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. The reason why we don't take action is that we have some negative reaction to our goal. Going on. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then when it happens, because we don't want to feel it, we withdraw. And we don't work on our goals and we get stuck. Yep. Again, it's charge. Yep. And when you think about spirituality, the only reason why spirituality exists is because of charge. I am not, uh, the only, I am not spiritual because when I close my eyes, I feel I'm this separate unit. Mm -hmm. And charge makes uh, this illusion. Mm -hmm. So basically, the, the, the only perpetrator here is charge. And it, it, so you cannot really separate spiritual development from problems or goals. Because, because yeah. the root of, the, uh, of all troubles is always charge. I see. And that's why I like spiritual technology, because it unifies all that. Mm -hmm. If you have a problem, you apply this process, and you remove this problem, and you also go uh, into a state behind polarities. If you have a problem with your uh, goal, you remove this negative reaction, you can work on your goal, your life becomes better, and you also, again, make a step towards a, a pure consciousness. As a coach, of course, I'm interested in goals, right? That's what I do yep. with drawing out visions and stuff for people. Also, yep. as a person, I'm interested in spiritual development. So, so you must get uh, people attracted to this technology and to you across a wide range. So you have people who are interested in the spiritual development path and exactly. se seeking unity and oneness. They're very that mm -hmm. would be their goal. <laughs> that would be their goal. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the smallest group. That's the smallest group. Yeah, uh, they exist. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I'm one of I'm one of those. Okay, that's yeah. what motivated me to to do spiritual technology. I would say that uh, a big big group is a group uh, that wants to resolve their problems, and also they're usually not aware, but they we can also work on our goals because problems and goals are just two coins, hmm. uh, two coins, two sides, sides of, the of the same, same coin. coin. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I say to you, my problem is fear of public speaking, I stated the goal as well, to impress the people. Right, if, the flip if of I, it. Mm -hmm. if, if I didn't have this goal to impress the public, I wouldn't have fear. Okay, so whether you uh, uh, think about the goal or whether you think about the problem, whatever attracts your attention, it's just a point of view. You cannot have a goal without a problem. Mm. We have many goals all the time. Uh, and we only notice them once we feel a negative reaction. Right. Then we say, oh, this is my goal, okay, but we only noticed it, otherwise we would just do it, we would just do it. But now we notice it because there is a barrier, there is a negative reaction. So basically, when you have a goal, if it's not just going by itself, it's me, it means that there is some negative reaction there, okay? And when you tell me I have a problem, yes, you have a problem because you, it, it's in uh, opposition to some of your goals. Right. This Otherwise is exactly what's brought problem. me to you in this work because my role as a shifted coach, I, again, I use visuals, I'm drawing out people's visions and desires. Some people, it's like that. As soon as we coalesce that kind of clarity of what they want, they're in alignment, it's bing, bang, boom, it's happening, smooth flowing. Uh, others, it's a little more complicated. So are very complicated and it's because of these problems and these underlying charges. So. Yes, yes, well. Uh, it's true. Uh, also, not all the clients are the same. Okay, some people are very easy to work with, some people are not. Not all the problems are the same. Yes. Okay. 
I mean, uh, in this world of uh, coaching or whatever you want to call it, uh, there is, uh, I think, a wrong belief that uh, when you have an uh, efficient method, you can say how long time it's going to take for every person and, and every problem. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. Individual. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very individual. Yes, yes. What are the ra give us some examples. You've talked about fear of uh, public speaking, so there's a problem. What are other problems that people would come to you to use this technology on? Well, uh, you can think about any kind of negative state or negative reaction, or even more precise, it could be emotion that I feel and I don't want to feel. It could be a behavior that I have and I don't want to have, or maybe some negative thoughts, mostly negative beliefs. Like I said, I am a good enough. I am jealous when my wife speaks to other men. I feel angry when my boss talks down to me. It's just about everything. Mm -hmm. okay. A problem is any sort of a reaction which I feel and I don't want to feel. Mm -hmm. Fear of heights, uh, just, just about, as I said, just about anything. Great. Um, my clients come for kind of the big four. So one is, like you mentioned already, starting a business. And it's mm -hmm. often a creative-based business. Um, money and financial stuff is really big. Yes. Yeah. Rela yes, yes. Relationship, different kinds of relationship I agree. problems, and then uh, body, often weight. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I completely agree with you. Now, when you put it like that, I agree with you. Yes, relationship, big, big and complicated yeah. uh, world. Okay. Yeah. Also, money, doesn't matter what country you come from. Okay. Also, people who, who come from wealthier countries, people who are not actually poor, they also have these thoughts and emotions right. about money. Okay, yeah, yeah, I agree. Body, health, yes, yeah. that's a big thing as well. And what was the first thing you noticed? Yeah, right, job. livelihood. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Th yeah. These are big, big, uh, big, big uh, uh, topics for me as well. I also like to think uh, about uh, topics in this way. Uh, it's just a different classification. Negative experiences. That's one thing we can work on. Mm -hmm. Problems. That's another thing we can work on. Uh, goals and also my current state. You probably had clients who say, I feel bad, I don't know why. Okay, right. so my current state, we can, so yeah, that's another classification. Wonderful. All those different entry points. Yeah, exactly, entry points. Yeah, so um, some of these modalities use tapping points. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people watch the session that you and I did together, you make mm -hmm. a little joke at the beginning about, you know, some people feel funny about this, and I've, mm -hmm. I'm bringing in EFT specialists and things too, so I'm starting to introduce this group to, uh, to the tapping points, so hopefully we're breaking through that kind of silliness factor about what is this tapping? Um, w what's your thoughts about that, about the charge and how it's in our somatic? and What's, okay. what's, what's these different methods that you use doing with that in terms of connecting in with the tapping? Okay, so you mean like how it is connected to the body and how we use the body? Uh, how yeah, to and, how the body. and that connection between you know the conscious and the unconscious and the unconscious stuff being stored in our body or in our somatic and in these different, at least the way I understand it, meridian lines or nadi yeah. systems. Yeah. Okay, well... I think it was uh, Willem Reich who, uh, who was in the Western uh, science who uh, pointed out the first that we use the body to suppress thoughts and emotions. Mm -hmm. And that's why he created a, a, a school of uh, psychotherapy which is still uh, in use. Uh, what they do, and they basically uh, apply psychotherapy and they apply massage. In my experience, we do use the physical body to suppress thoughts and emotions. You know, all these tensions that come up, you know, the, what's the first thing that happens when you're under stress? You feel tension. Right. Okay. Another interesting point, I, uh, I do lots of uh, regression therapy, recalling mm -hmm. past lives. Mm -hmm. And what happens uh, as we lead the person through a past life memory, what happens is this. When they die, uh, they, when they lose the physical body, they lose maybe uh, the most important instrument of suppression. Mm. We use the physical body uh -huh. to suppress these thoughts and emotions, okay? And what happens when you lose the physical body, uh, there is a forceful release of suppressed thoughts and emotions in consciousness. When you release okay? the body with everything yep. that's holding. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know how in the movies uh, you see how your, your, uh, when somebody dies, their whole life flashes in front of their eyes. I think that's related to the fact that when, when, you, when we lose body, 
uh, uh, there is this uh, forceful release of charge because there is no the main barrier is not there anymore. Uh, also, you know how the church speaks about the purgatory. To me, yes, there is a purgatory, only it's not a place. It's it's a state, <laughs> a, which all these charge releases into into the consciousness. One of the uh, uh, spiritual teachers uh, said that this release happens until there is an equal amount of positive and negative, and then it stops because mm. this equal amount keeps both sides in balance. Back to the okay. clarity. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly, and then we retain a certain part of that past life. Basically, we can only remember past lives because there is some charge left over, associated. Otherwise, we, we, we wouldn't be able to remember. Uh -huh. okay. So, in my opinion, yes, we use the physical body for, uh, to suppress charge. That's why we, they have all those asanas in yoga and there are all forms of uh, relaxation uh, uh, techniques okay, to get us to finally relax. Uh, as for the points, mm -hmm. uh, I know the theory behind these points. The theory says that basically as you put your fingers or tap, we don't tap, ba by mm -hmm. the way, just yeah, put your you just hold fingers. Yeah. Yes, as you hold uh, fingers or tap, you stimulate meridians. Okay, and then as you stimulate meridians, energy moves and then it repairs uh, the aura, okay, your energy body. Yep. Um, yeah, that's the theory. I'm, I'm not so sure how correct is that theory. Uh, uh, what I think is uh, in deep beat, in this method in which uh, you and I use the points, I think points are secondary. Mm. In my opinion, points are secondary. The, the other structure of the process is more important. The mind content that comes up is more important and how we notice and how we integrate polarities. I see. Okay. So that's my opinion. If you ask me, uh, yep, points are there, we use them, but I think in this technique at least, they are mm. secondary. Mm -hmm. And how we handle the mind content that comes up, that's primary. Mm. And trusting, I guess, uh, how it unfolds has its own elegance for each person, right? It's kind of how that's yeah. stored or layered for that particular person, and it comes out bit by bit according to, to that. It, yes, exactly. Uh, we make it conscious bit by bit. Uh, you know, if you think about it, we didn't create all these thoughts and emotions at once. <laughs> no. Okay. So right. we can't make it conscious all at once. So we have to take steps. And yes, it is different from differ for different people. Sometimes the process lasts short, 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes it lasts 45 minutes. Okay. It also depends not just on what kind of personality you are. It depends on have you been doing any processing recently? Maybe you haven't. So it accumulated. Okay. Or maybe we just hit a bigger problem. Mm. Okay. So it's, it's a relative. Mm -hmm. It's all connected in these interesting ways. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. You asked me about polarities a number of times, and yeah. I don't know whether I answered that. Uh, probably I mentioned it. Basically, polarities are the main reason for our problem. Okay. If you think about it, uh, uh, the main, in my opinion, one of the main polarities is uh, what happens and what I would like to happen. In every life situation, uh, when we feel something negative, it's because there is a difference between what happens and what I would like to happen. Mm -hmm. That's the main polarity that creates charge. And for example, I want to approach a woman and I approach and what I would like to happen, I would like to have a positive response, but I get a negative response. Okay. So in that case, there is a difference between what happens and what I would like to happen. And I feel negative reaction. And because I feel negative reaction, I, won't, I immediately want to solve it. I don't want to feel it. I want to solve it. And the way how we solve it, we suppress and we make a decision. Uh, like women are j dangerous, I should keep away from relationship or something like that. A decision of defeat. We bring those decisions to prevent the same outcome in the future. Mm -hmm. to, 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 to save Protection. myself from the same outcome in the future. And that's how we create charge. Next time when I want to approach or think about approaching a woman, what happens is... I have this reaction which says in the background, remember what happened last time, women are dangerous, you can get hurt, and so on and so on. So basically, uh, there is very important polarity, what happens and what I would like to happen. When you think about our goals, not just negative experiences, you think about goals, uh, in its nature, a goal is a difference uh, between what happens and what I would like to happen. Uh, I don't have enough money, okay? So what happens is not enough money, what I would like to happen is more money. That's where the problem is. 
or if I'm alone, the problem is my current situation is I'm alone and I would like to be with, be with somebody. There is a polarity there, being alone and being with somebody. Mm -hmm. So it's all, it's all about polarities. You think about problems, fear of public speaking. Uh, what happens is fear of public speaking. What I would like to happen is uh, confidence. Okay. So yes, these polarities are, uh, uh, that's what uh, creates charge, the difference between what happens and what I would like to happen in all aspects of life. And then we are polarized. Think about this. If I have a girlfriend, a relationship, everything is going fine. That means I have a part in me, a need, uh, a need for a relationship, for love and intimacy and everything that I get from a relationship. And then in one moment, she says, you know, I found some, someone else and I fell in love with someone else and I want to break up with you. And in, in that moment, I'm shocked, confused, and I make some de decision like, oh, uh, relationships can hurt. So what happened now? Now I have I just created another part in me, mm. fear of relationship, and that in itself wouldn't be a problem. But it is a problem because the previous part, the part that wants a relationship, is still there. Right. And now, and now I have this now conflict. You've got the mooring. Mm -hmm. yep, I have a conflict. One side that wants a relationship, and the other side that which is fear. You can call it this polarity: love and fear, if you mm -hmm. want. Okay, love and fear. And when I am in this kind of conflict. This is what happens to me. When I, am, when I am single, the part which is fear, the part which wants to protect me, that part is passive. It's passive because its goal to protect me is satisfied. There is no relationship, there is no danger, so it's, it's quiet. But the other part which wants a relationship, love and intimacy, that part is not happy because its goal is not fulfilled. So it creates a negative reaction. I don't have it. I don't have love. I don't have intimacy. I don't have a relationship. And then uh, it becomes stronger and stronger, and it takes over in one moment, okay? And then I go into a relationship. And in the beginning, I'm happy. Finally, a relationship, okay? But then this part uh, which wants a relationship, it becomes more and more passive. Why? Because its goal is fulfilled. It's been met. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's been met, exactly. And then, but this other part, which is afraid of a uh, relationship, it becomes little by little active. Huh. Yep. Because, because it says, remember what happened last time. Where is she now? Who is she talking to? And so on and so on. And just notice, when I'm polarized, I only have two options, to be someone or to be alone. And in both uh, situations, I have, a, I have a negative reaction. So that's how polarities work. Two options only and uh, negative, negative reaction in both situations. When we integrate the polarity, what happens is this. When I integrate all my thoughts about being with someone, and all my thoughts about being alone, about the both sides of the polarity. I can choose. I can stay alone for as long uh, as I have to, for as long as an opportunity arises, without having these compulsive states. Or I can be in a relationship without having compulsive thoughts about being hurt. That doesn't mean that I forgot that it is possible that I can, I can get hurt. I didn't forget that. Okay? Uh, but I don't have compulsive thoughts all the time about it. Okay, so yeah, polarities, uh, that's how they create problems. Basically, when you're polarized, you have two options. I mean, even when you're not polarized, you have two options because we live in this bipolar world. Uh, but uh, when you're polarized, whichever option you take, you have some negative reaction. <laughs> when you're not polarized, you can choose, you can enjoy both sides. Hmm. And it's back to that oneness, that, that, that both allowing both. Yes. Hmm. yes. It's also reminding me, I'm not sure, I'm guessing you're pretty familiar with this, probably a lot of your clients bring it forth. I've played around with law of attraction techniques for quite some time. And um, I'm resonating with what you're saying about underneath the supposed desire for something is mm -hmm. actually more of a focus on the lack of it or the the problems associated with it than on the positivity of that thing. O or also what you're saying is if you, when you do manifest that, then something happens. Yeah. yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Basically, whenever someone talks about something a lot, they're usually suppressing it. Hmm. For example, if I am trying to appear confident all the time and I'm really investing effort to be confident, I'm most likely suppressing uh, insecurity. Mm. Yeah. So, 
if I want to be strong and, you know, people who, who talk about being very successful all the time, who are actually overburdened with these thoughts of success, they are usually uh, uh, su suppressing insecurity or f feeling like a failure or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yes, when we have this, uh, that's also being polarized, okay, be being uh, obsessed with some thoughts of success or uh, thoughts of, I don't know, uh, confidence, it usually means that you are trying to compensate for something. I don't know whether that's what you, what you were talking about. It fits in. It fits in for yeah. sure. Yeah. Good. Uh, there's a couple of spicy things you talked about. So mm -hmm. you, you've talked about past lives. I want to ask you a bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Also, um, entities. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. do these two concepts fit in? I know for myself with um, past lives, I, I trained as a hypnotherapist and know those protocols. I don't, mm -hmm. o I don't often do them straight up, but I do find that occasionally working with a client when they're focusing on something, it will spontaneously emerge some sort of connection or remembrance. To s it's the familiar, so the charge mm -hmm. or the fear is familiar. So mm -hmm. someone's wanting to manifest, say, their... Um, um, their healing abilities or their energy work or something in the now, right? And they come up against this block about this is this is dangerous or it's not comfortable mm. for me to be visible, it's not comfortable for me to speak, it's not comfortable for me to help. And then we trace that and what we're led to is some sort mm. of... Uh, I'm still kind of out on whether this is truly a past life or this is some sort of collective conscious thing that somebody is tapping into. To me, it doesn't matter. It's coming up, mm. so they have a link to it. Um, yes. uh, and then when we go in and see what happened in that remembrance, we see the correlation to the, to current, the current situation mm. and um, do an integration process to help with that. And again, it's, el it's eliminating charge. Exactly. So so you have protocols working with past life, and you have protocols also working with entities. entities so, yes. so what can you share about that? It sounds really interesting. Okay. Well, uh, as for past lives, first of all, it's very difficult to have any proof, okay, this is really a past life. Right. For, for me, personally, there is no uh, doubt, uh, because I, uh, perceive, I perceive my past life and all the identities that came up and emotions and thoughts that I couldn't in any way associate with my current life. Mm. And uh, for me, because I remembered so many of those before, uh, I, as I was uh, doing a past life recovery on myself. Mm -hmm. So f for me, there is no doubt, but I cannot prove it. Right. Okay. I also did probably close to 1,000 sessions with other people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I had enough of uh, indicators and experience to believe that these are really past lives, mm -hmm. okay? However, I cannot prove that. I don't think anybody can. Uh, it's, it's interesting when you do past lives. Uh, first of all, you know how I mentioned that we have, we remember uh, uh, when a person dies, they release most of their charge. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the truth is that most of the charge that we carry in this life is from this life, mm -hmm. okay? And very uh, little of the complete amount, of the entire amount, is from past lives. So when I do a session, uh, I can basically clear one past life in approximately one hour. So the question is, how can you clear one past life in one hour and you do thousands of processes or, 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 you know, and you still have charge from this life? Well, it's because ma majority of our charge is from this life. Mm -hmm. And it's still interesting to do past lives uh, because that's still our charge. If I carry a decision from a past life, it still affects me. Right. Okay. Here is one. Uh, here is one example. Uh, I work with a client who uh, who remembered that he was uh, a member of some African tribe a few hundred years ago, and that African tribe had had a conflict with a neighboring tribe. And as conflicts uh, usually, you know, happen, it's about uh, profiteering. At that time, it was about stealing uh, cattle and women from from the neighboring neighboring tribe. And he was one of the guys who wanted to establish peace with the neighboring tribe. But then there were others who didn't want to, because when it's conflict, you can steal. And then there was a, a conflict, a physical conflict between his tribe and the neighboring tribe, and a number of people get killed, including him. Mm. And as he was outside of the body, looking 
at the dead people and his body as well, he uh, brought a decision, he made a decision to keep peace at any cost. Mm. Generally, that's a positive decision, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To keep peace at any cost. However, no compulsive, unconscious decision is 100% positive. Because in, one, in some situations, in, in, it will be optimal. In some other situation, it will create problems. Mm -hmm. For example, for him, it created a, a, a complete lack of ability to confront people. Now, I'm not talking about physical confrontation. I'm talking about everyday confrontation that you must have. Complete codependency, yeah. Exactly, you must <laughs> have to confront people mm -hmm. uh, every day, okay? Yeah. So, so uh, he couldn't even do that on, on the most basic level. Mm -hmm. He goes to a store, he buys something, he gets incorrect change, he notices that the change is incorrect, but the very moment he thinks about uh, saying that, he has a negative reaction, fear, and he withdraws. So even though these uh, decisions, which are very important, even though they, they are from past lives, they are actually all here and now. All charges here and now. So when we do past lives, we, we want to do that for therapeutic purposes. We want to do them to remove uh, their effect on the, our current life. Uh, we use the technique called memento. The, the purpose of that technique is to remember the most important situations from that life, mm -hmm. clear them of charge, and then to remember the moment of dying in which we usually bring important decisions. Mm -hmm. They are decisions for the future. It's what he did, okay? He was looking at his uh, dead body and the dead body of the other people, and he basically said, from now on, to, ki to keep it's peace. I decided, blanket, at, blanket decision. At, mm -hmm. at any cost. Mm -hmm. And it, it remains unconscious, and it affects him uh, in, in the now. So that's what we do. Basically, we clear uh, uh, situations, important situations from past lives, and we clear uh, uh, the moment of death and decisions brought in that moment. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned entities. Mm -hmm. this, this is my experience with entities. Uh, entities, in my experience, are more suppressed parts of my personality. Mm -hmm. They usually happen when I am exposed to some traumatic experience. When I did something very bad to someone else, or when something very bad is done to me and I cannot live with it. Mm. So I split this part and I say, uh uh, this is not me. This is someone or something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'll give you why. I mean, they don't happen only in past lives, they also happen when you do processes in everyday life. Mm -hmm. But uh, because most people, uh, are not exposed to such traumatic experiences in the current life, they have less of entities in uh, coming up, created in, in this life. In past lives, uh, we often have violent death, deaths. Okay, mm -hmm. People die, and then it's uh, common that they created an entity. Or maybe they killed someone, mm -hmm. and they couldn't, uh, so co they couldn't uh, face it, they couldn't live with it. So they said, oh no, this is not me, hmm. this is someone or something else. And shove it off to the side, huh? Yes, it's a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's a defense mechanism. Uh, and then what happens when you clear charge, which they perceive as mine, they made some room, some space, for deeper stuff to come to the surface. Okay? And then uh, when we clear a past life charge, it happens that an entity comes up. Okay? Even though they perceive it as something else, mm -hmm. someone else, mm -hmm. uh, in my experience, and I think uh, uh, I confirmed that by uh, 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 getting rid, by using the technique to get rid of them, uh, uh, which treats them as my own charge, not as someone else attached to me. I see. Hmm. Uh, so yes, uh, it happens. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, a client. Uh, uh, let's say he was, uh, according to his uh, 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 memory, a few hundred years ago, he was in some part of Russia, a distant part of Russia, and uh, he wanted to be a carpenter. He wanted to work with woods. Okay. Uh, however, uh, a, an opportunity presented itself to uh, serve, to be a military person, and because it brought him uh, decent money and also uh, socially it was more uh, appreciated than just being a carpenter, he accepted that. Uh, he had to live away from his family, and he was like a soldier for like 20 years. 
and he collected money, saved money, and when he left the military, uh, he started a business with a few friends. However, the business completely collapsed, okay, and he was left without anything, uh, without all the money that he saved. And then he started drinking, uh, and after some time, he hanged himself in his daughter's house. Mm. Obviously, that's a very uh, traumatic uh, experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happened, what happened at the end, you know how they say that at, at the end of the past life, you go into a light. Right. That light represents, basically, when you get rid, when you release the charge, it represents your uh, normal uh, state of the self. Uh, the state in which you feel that you arrived home. That's what happens when you go into that light. Uh, however, people who have these entities, because they still have charge, connecting, connecting them to, the, to this past light, they can't move to this uh, mm -hmm. light. Yep. And then I, I asked him, is there something there holding you to that, to that life or to that place of death? And then yes, he said, I have this entity. Okay. And then we apply the technique. And when you apply the technique, in the beginning you get answers, crazy answers, because it's the, the worst kind of charge. You know how from the movies, like Hollywood movies, they have this, you know, entity mm -hmm. uh, swearing at you and all that. Mm -hmm. You get crazy answers in the beginning, mm -hmm. but as you keep going, the real content comes up. Like, I am, uh, this is my uh, uh, negative, bad, uh, this is my guilt. Yeah. This is my guilt about what I've done, okay? Yeah. So basically, the worst parts Especially come up. Especially daughter's home. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The worst parts come up and they also get integrated. Mm -hmm. So to cut the, 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 story, sh uh, the, uh, the story short, uh, entities, in my opinion, are my charge, uh, my thoughts and emotions, but something which was really that bad, then I just couldn't live with it. So I actually find a way out by saying, this is not me. Yeah. Okay. And then that was a solution. Dissociation, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's quite um, the fad right now in certain circles in the U.S., uh, North America too. I'm in Canada with entity removal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I understand. There are techniques that work with entities, but my, uh, my uh, rule is I ask the client, that which you perceive, do you perceive it as you, a part of you, or mm -hmm. something, or someone else? If they say that they perceive it as something or someone else, then I use an entity integration technique. Mm -hmm. But if they say, no, it's just me, it's just part of me, my emotion, my, then I just use normal techniques which clear charge from the I point of view. You can treat anything as an entity. You can say, well, I have a fear of heights. We can treat that as an yeah. entity. No problem. Yeah. No problem. And we can apply uh, uh, entity techniques on that too. But I don't think that is the best possible approach. For me, the best possible approach, if you perceive it as your part, then we use techniques like deep beat and aspectics. But if you say you perceive it as uh, something or someone else, then we use entity integration techniques. But you can use both on both situations, but, uh, you know, I like this clean approach. Mm -hmm. And you're rattling off different names, which is great, because it helps to show people that there's a variety of techniques. So yep. depending on what's presenting, you as a practitioner are just using your experience and your intuition to choose from amongst those palliative tools. Yeah. It's true. There are different techniques. You can say that there are, I call them special purpose techniques and general purpose techniques. Special ones like Memento for integrating past lives. It has a purpose to integrate past lives. Then there is something called Gnostic Intensive. Its goal is for you to experience uh, what we call enlightenment mm. or the direct experience of truth. To experience the truth on, uh, about who you really are or what is life or what is another human being. So that's another special purpose technique. Mm -hmm. And you have these general purpose techniques like uh, deep feet or aspectics or DP4. Uh, these methods are applicable to any negative reaction that you can have. You may have a negative reaction about uh, an experience or you may have a problem or you may have a negative reaction about the goal. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so you can use these general purpose techniques to, uh, to integrate them. Uh, just one more thing, yeah. even, though, even though I say this is general purpose, this is uh, special, they basically do all the same thing. Mm. They integrate charge. Mm. Step Only by step, working down to come to that unity place again, eh? Yes. So the entry point is different and your goal is different, but to reach your goal, you have to integrate charge. The only thing uh, in this technology, 
the only thing that stands on your way is suppressed thoughts and emotions. Hmm. I'm just finding as I'm listening to these um, stories that you're sharing to give examples of things that have come out of your practice, just how fascinating it is, how fascinating what people carry with them. Like, isn't it just amazing all the different things that it's you tap into with each individual? Yes, it's very fascinating. Basically, you have to go through people's lives, for example, past lives. I've done, as I said, close to 1,000 sessions. And basically in one hour, I can go through someone's life, a past life, in one hour. And then you actually see how our lives are generally very simple. Mm. What is complicated is how we perceive them on the inside. Mm. If we go and integrate someone's life and they come up with f five important experiences, like I went, I started going to school, I finished school, I got a job, I got married, I got kids, and then I died. Okay, so basically that, that's what comes up. And then when you think about it, when you look around, most people will have lives like that, even today, don't they? Yep. Uh, but it doesn't feel like that. Why? Because we have all these internal things going on. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> what, and um, I can say my own answer from my experience. I mean, obviously, I think it's useful, and I'm bringing you on for an interview to introduce you to my students because I want them to know about this. But what do, what do people tend to report in terms of results when they're, when they're using these techno on the technologies? How does that play out in their life? Uh, we don't have any official statistics because no one, no one does that, but the feedback is very good. Yeah. People just give them very good results. People give us uh, good feedback and uh, they come back for more. Mm -hmm. Basically, that, that's, uh, that's how it happens. Not everyone, uh, not, uh, this is not for everyone, yeah. okay? This technique requires you to confront the stuff that comes up, good point. okay? And that's basically the only unpleasant part about, uh, about it, because we have this, we have charge, because we don't want to face it. You know how spiritual teachers say that uh, if you go into the acceptance mode, then that's the key right. for spirituality. Yes, it is, uh, but people just can't go into acceptance mode, okay? And uh, yes, uh, uh, in, uh, these techniques require you to face uh, the stuff that comes up, there's negative thoughts and emotions, and that's the only unpleasant part about them. Uh, but generally, we have excellent uh, uh, results, and uh, there are more and more uh, people uh, wanting to do sessions and seminars. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, because uh, some of the people listening to this are going to want to learn more about this. So you do different kinds of trainings. So, uh, so I've been doing a training, or I've been trained by a woman who you know, who's local here in Canada, yes. and now I'm definitely going to be coming to you and doing one of your trainings. So, explain a little bit about that, how how that works, so people are aware. Okay, uh, what I do is uh, sessions and seminars. Uh, individual sessions, it simply means that we are uh, applying these methods on you, working on your problems or your goals or your past lives. Uh, uh, in uh, sessions, I don't teach people how to do these methods. I am just uh, somebody who is like a coach. Yes. Okay. So I basically work with people in sessions, individual sessions, uh, in person or over Skype, mm -hmm. over the internet. Uh, the other thing that I do is seminars. Uh, seminars can be group or individual. Uh, group seminars can be uh, uh, like a classroom seminars, or uh, they can also be over the internet only. When the group seminars are over the internet, I accept up to three persons. I cannot accept more to maintain the quality of training. Mm. And also what I do are individual seminars. Great. So in, in individual seminars, we teach people how to use these processes on themselves and on others. We also teach them to become trainers, mm -hmm. to train other people to do it. Wonderful. Well, we'll be talking because uh, I'm pretty sure some of the people who will be listening to this from my group of people will be interested. They're, like I said, many are process professionals, they're coaches, they're therapists, they're facilitators. This could be a wonderful tool, like you said, to apply to their own stuff, but also to fit into their practices as well because it's so great to learn more about things that really are working for people and are creating that kind of peace and stability for them in their lives. I'm going to conclude here with just, um, I ask each person, I'm doing these interviews for this practical energy work class, I ask them about their thoughts about the future of humanity. What an easy little question, huh? <laughs> well, obviously it's, it's not easy. I was thinking about that as well, like probably everyone else. Well, the only thing that I can say is that we are on a crossroad, okay? I can say that both uh, bad and good things are happening, okay? And which one is going to prevail is very difficult to say. 
Uh, from my point of view, what I can say is this. I can see that this kind of technology is one day going to become uh, something that uh, everybody, everyone knows and, and does. Think about this. Only 300 uh, years ago, 200 years ago, uh, personal hygiene was not on a very high level in most countries. Right. Today, it is not acceptable to not have you know, proper personal <laughs> hygiene. Yes. However, we know very little about uh, mental and psychological hygiene. Huh. And that's exactly what I'm talking about here. This is about uh, psychological hygiene, about mental hygiene. We don't know anything about that. We are not taught in schools. We are just, we just suppress, suppress like, you know, ourselves like in a rubbish bin, literally, yeah. okay? And now this awareness about this personal hy uh, hygiene, this uh, 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 mental hygiene is uh, rising, okay? And I believe that one day I, I see uh, that as a good thing. One day uh, I believe that it is going to be taught in schools as well. Like when I was, when I was in school, they taught me about physical hygiene, okay? But it didn't tell me anything about uh, psychological hygiene. I believe that in a few hundred years, or probably even earlier, this will be taught in schools as well. That's just from my point of view. And uh, uh, the future of the humanity, I just, you know, well, cannot, you cannot, <laughs> cannot predict. I just can say that like many other people, I'm noticing both good and bad things happening, and now it's probably some kind of crossroad, and which one will prevail? I, I like to believe that the good one will prevail. Yeah, yeah, me too. And you're doing your part. Okay. <laughs> thank you. This has thank been you. really informative and really enjoyable. So thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting me.